in the situation now if, as a result of the COVID and, and how they're keeping the arts alive. So without further ado, I would like to jump right into um, introductions. We have, um, I'm gonna just go around the room and ask each of them to, to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, so Tim, if you would kick it off for us, your name, title, name of organization, and yours in the community, and your one sentence vision statement. Sure, uh, Tim Hankst, I'm executive director of the Kingsman Shakespeare Company. Uh, the Kingsman Shakespeare Company has been around since 1997. We were uh, planning on our 24th season in the community, uh, presenting professional programs and performances, the works of uh, William Shakespeare for the education and entertainment of people throughout the ages. Um, Cindy Goldberg. I'm Cindy Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of the Conejo Schools Foundation, which has been um, in the community since 2003. And our mission is different from many of yours in that we focus on students um, and providing opportunities and enrichment for kids in the Conejo Valley Unified School District. So um, we have about 30% of the population that participate in some form of actual class as opposed and um, our mission is to build stronger bridges with the community to uh, enhance those opportunities for students. Jonathan Surratt. Hi, I'm Jonathan Surratt. I'm the general manager of the Bank of America Performing Arts Center. Uh, we've been in the community for just over 25 years now, uh, October of 1994. And our vision statement is the arts, an integral uh, part of life. Cheryl Marvin. Hi, everybody. It's uh, Cheryl Marvin. I am the executive director for the Caneo Valley Youth Orchestras. Uh, we are going into our 60th concert season. And our mission is to inspire youth through the study and performance of classical symphonic music. Cindy Murray. Hello everyone, my name is Cindy Murray. I'm the executive director of Five Star Theatricals and we have been in the community over 30 years uh, and our first performance at the Cavalier Theater was Music Man. And um, our mission is to provide Broadway caliber theater and to foster educational uh, opportunities for um, our growing younger audience and to um, provide outreach to the seniors and the military and the uh, at need and at risk children in our community. Phyllis Rottenberg, and I hope I didn't butcher your last name. Nope, that's right. Uh, I represent the Thousand Oaks Philharmonic and I am a board member, a performer in the orchestra and a teacher of some of our soloists. Um, we have been in the community since 2001 and our mission is uh, <laughs> for students in Ventura County and including the Las Virginas School District to provide solo opportunities for young musicians with a professional orchestra. Uh, Brian Bemmel. Brian, you're muted. Hi, I'm Brian Bemmel. I'm the uh, Executive Director of Performances to Grow On. We've been at the Civic Arts Plaza since the very beginning our mission is to use the performing arts to enhance the educational curriculum of schools all over Ventura County. Debbie Seimer. Good morning, I'm Debbie Seimer and I'm Seymour, the sorry. president of the Music Teachers Association Conejo Valley. Our local group started in 1966. Our state group began in 1897 and our mission is to pursue excellence in music education and to advance the music teaching profession. Uh, Kim Maselli. Hi there, my name is Kim Maselli and I'm the Artistic Director of Pacific Festival Ballet. Uh, for the past 25 years, we've been performing at the Civic Arts Plaza and our mission is threefold, um, to bring world-class professionals and productions to the stage, to uh, focus on presenting the beauty and the traditions of classical ballet, and then also to educate our community and help launch dancers into careers of their own. Wonderful. Bonnie Hicks. 
Hi, my name is Bonnie Hicks. I'm the president of Village Voices Corral. We've been in the community for over 50 years, started in 1969. Um, and our mission two, twofold is to um, bring people together that love to sing in a choral setting. And also we provide um, grants for elementary school music programs and scholarships to um, students uh, pursuing vocal performance. And Natalia Stanova. Um, hi, Nikki. Thank you for having us. So nice to see you all. I haven't seen you in so many months. Uh, New West Symphony, along with five star theatricals and Pacific Festival Ballet, um, is a resident company of Bank of America Performing Arts Center in Thousand Oaks. So we've been around for 25 years, as long as the center has been around. Our mission is to inspire passion for symphonic music through live performances and education initiatives that engage and enrich our diverse audiences. Uh, we miss you all. And that's why we're all here together uh, in this way. So thank you all. Um, and I'll just introduce TO Arts. Um, as I said, I'm the director of development for TO Arts. We have been around for three years. However, we are the result of a merger between two longstanding arts nonprofits in the community. Um, and our vision is to ensure that the arts thrive for all. And hence, uh, uh, this, this gathering to, to kind of talk about this. So um, tell me if you would, and, and now going forward, you know, just raise your hand um, when, you, when you need to speak. And um, I'll just kind of call on you and you can unmute yourselves. We'll keep everything muted just so that we have a clean recording in the meantime. Um, but you don't all have to answer every question. So don't feel like you have to jump in for everything. Uh, in an average production or performance, how many musicians or performers do you normally engage or employ? Phyllis. The Thousand Oaks Philharmonic employs an average of 46 musicians and in, we give uh, three concerts a year and in each concert we feature seven young uh, soloists. And, and while you're at it, if you would answer for me too, how much, how many, what is your average audience for each production? Um, about 300 to 350 people. Awesome. Who else would? Tim. Yes, for the summer uh, festival, we imply, uh, we employ over 50 uh, people, actors, stage and crew, tech crew, designers, costumes for the summer festival. Um, we average about 300. Uh, we have 18 performances for the summer, get a, around 7,000 people for this summer. Awesome. Uh, Debbie, and then Cindy, Murray. For our typical student recital, we might have 30 students playing with maybe 70 or 80 in the audience, and then we'll have five or six or seven of those recitals back to back on any given day. Cindy? So our normal performances, we employ and bring in from out of the county, um, actors and tech crew. Um, and a typical, typical is about 100 people as far as the actors and the creative staff. And our average house, it, you know, it really depends on the show. Um, uh, Matilda was full and uh, Jekyll and Hyde, not so much. So it fluctuates from, uh, anywhere from 400 to 900 per show. Um, anyone else want to jump in? We're having technical difficulties on this on the Facebook side. So I'm going to go see if we can fix that. But Kim, go ahead. And then I'll come back in a second. Uh, so our um, similar to Cindy's, our um, population depends upon the production. Um, in the summer, we're in the Shear, which is a smaller theater, and so uh, production dancer-wise, I'd say we're maybe at 40, um, and generally with a full house, which I think is, what, almost 400? Um, then our, our spring productions are larger uh, in size and audience, I would say close to 100 dancers, audience ranging between 800 and 1,000 per performance. And then our big guns, the Nutcracker, we have, prob we have two full casts, so there's probably a total of 200 um, performers and um, we usually have close to full houses so I'd say between 12 and 1600 uh, per performance. Awesome who else would like to just uh, jump in while I fix our Facebook stream because we have a lot of people waiting to watch us over there as well. 
So it's Cindy Goldberg with the Kineo Schools Foundation. We, I am having hand raising issues. So if you see me clap or something, then you'll know I, or wave, it's because I'm trying to raise my hand. We um, typically um, have a 10 night music festival at the um, Bank of America Performing Arts Center that is called the All District Music Festival. And we have about 5,500 students that participate um, in those 10 nights. Um, it's about 30%, close to 30% of our kids participate in some form, some way, shape or form. So it's been sort of a huge loss this, this season not to be able to present, just like all of you. Awesome. Um, anyone else before we jump on to the next question? No, Natalia, go ahead. I've been counting people behind me on the stage, so it took me a moment. Um, um, so we have between uh, 60 to 100 musicians, depending on the program. Uh, we also partner with uh, a lot of community organizations, choir. We partnered before with uh, resident companies, so um, it varies. We're very fortunate that we have grown our audiences to include over 600 subscribers. So we do six performances a year and um, minimum we have 600 subscribers, um, but um, we usually have a house about between 1100 and 1400 on good nights. So thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move on to this other question. Um, the, the, the reason why we're all here really is what are some of your biggest challenges besides the obvious? We can't perform, we can't gather people live. So I'm hearing so many of you with such large um, employment of musicians and artists. Um, so tell, share with us some of these challenges that you are facing um, in, you know, in your own work. Who would like to go? Cindy Murray. Maybe I talk too much. <laughs> um, I think our biggest challenge is, there's a couple of it. Financial is obviously, uh, uh, you know, staying in business while we're not generating any income. Um, challenges uh, reaching out to the community. Whoops. Uh, reaching out to the community um, without creating online fatigue. Because, uh, you know, everybody's on Zoom meetings and Facebook and, and we have to be sensitive to that. And, but I think our biggest challenge is not knowing, not knowing when we can perform. We're just in limbo. Bonnie, go ahead. Yeah, I would agree with Cindy. That's, I think that's the biggest challenge is not knowing. Well, I, we sent out a survey to our members, you know, just, but things change so quickly. So what they're feeling right now might change by the end of summer. So it's like trying to plan for the next season. What are we going to do? Are we going to have it? Are we going to, you know, because if people are afraid to come and rehearse or, you know, that's one problem. And then are people going to come and he come to a performance? Are we going to even be allowed to have a performance? You know, what, what is the government going to say? So it's kind of like a limbo kind of what, what are we going to do? So, um, and then trying to engage the mem you know, our members still, and they miss, like, I'm sure all of you miss, you miss your community of, you know, performers and, and getting together and doing this art that you love. So those are the challenges that I see. Kim. So I think all of the above for us, um, and I think most of us as directors, you know, we're planners and we plan our seasons, you know, a year, two years in advance. And I think the hardest thing is just to kind of be in a state of limbo and not really know what direction we're going or choices we can make. And I remember Jonathan, um, you and I having conversations almost weekly initially going, okay, well, we could push this show to here and that show to here. And, and so in the next week we'd go, well, that's not going to work. So we'll do this to this and this to this. And finally, I think we were like, well, maybe we should just stop talking for a while and we'll just wait and see what unfolds. But it's hard to stay in no man's land and also just to um, keep morale up, you know, with your performers and, and dancers. And we get the questions fired at us, you know, well, when are we going to finish the show? Are we going to do the show? And, and just not to have any concrete answers, I think has been really challenging. Our, our biggest challenge, since we do so much work with the schools, 
is are the schools going to be in session and ready to go on field trips so we're kind of in a wait and see time for now Jonathan, yeah so uh for the performing arts center we're in a little bit of a different scenario because unlike all unlike the uh, majority of our uh, other panelists we are not a producing entity so for us we're actually reliant on all of the organizations who rent the facility to put on their programs and that's been one of the biggest challenges uh, that's one of the biggest challenges for us simply because we don't necessarily have the ability to pivot to an online model because we don't produce anything our, our business is supporting all of the customers um, so that that is one of the biggest uh, concerns for us especially with so much uncertainty and unknown and Kim you're absolutely right those early conversations were kind of you know we can push for a month or we can push for two months and now you know those that time has passed so we're we're kind of waiting to figure out what uh, what guidance is going to be given from the state and from the county and and we're waiting for that green light so we can go ahead and get back to what it is that we all love to do Ooh. yeah Phyllis our mission as a uh, the TL Phil as a professional orchestra is that we have student performers and those those students audition on a piece of music that they've worked on for a very long time they audition in November and then we build our three concerts based on the students that win a, a solo position and so in addition to all of the other challenges you know we feel a disappointment in our kids that they've they've worked so hard on this piece of music and we're trying to work out a way that maybe they can perform another piece in the 2021 season but then of course it impacts who those soloists are too so mm -hmm. it's really hard on our kids anyone else want to share something or shall we and you guys are such a well-behaved group that I don't think I need to, you don't have to raise, you know, just like speak one after the other because it seems like it's working really well. So don't wait for my permission. All right. Well, as uh, a private music teachers, most of us meet our students either in our home or in a studio. And of course, we can't have them face to face. So many of us have had a huge learning curve, learning how to do Zoom and becoming sound engineers and how do you get music to um, go across the lines? How do you avoid the lag? It's been a real challenge challenge but most of us have been able to figure it out most of our students have continued on with us so we're really grateful but boy becoming a techie um, has been a big challenge um so okay let's pivot now and talk about what's been great because with every challenge really there's an opportunity right so how are you making lemonade out of these lemons um this is Tim from Kingsman Shakespeare. Um, we are planning an opening night, uh, which was the original opening night of our festival on uh, Friday the 26th of June, and it'll be a virtual opening night. So we're um, asking for reservations. We have plans with uh, past actors that we've used in the past. And so I think an exciting night, even though it's going to be virtual. Awesome. You know, Cindy, um, our, our uh, not Cindy, sorry, Nikki, our training school, California Dance Theater, um, offers probably over 100 classes a week um, to dancers in the community. And then as a result of, of all the shutdowns, I've had alumni come home that are dancing with different ballet companies, and they're all just here in their homes. Um, and what I've noticed, well, right away we jumped on it and we created a YouTube channel for dance classes of all different genres, our teachers just donated their time. Um, we created a Zoom curriculum so dancers can still dance at home. But quite honestly, I think dance and ballet is a little different than music in the sense that you need space to do your craft. And it's kind of like playing tennis in your kitchen. You know, it just, it just doesn't work, you need the room. Um, so I feel like, you know, dancers have kind of, their wings have been clipped to a certain degree and um, but what I've noticed is just their dedication to the art, like they will do anything to still get up, put their dance clothes on, find a place in their house where they can take a ballet class. I have one girl who's in her garage and she uses an ironing board as her ballet bar. And it just shows the, the heart and soul 
of the artist and, and those that really are serious and, and nothing is going to stop them. Yeah, go ahead, Sandy. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're concentrating on the um, children of the community. And for the last four weeks, we provided a free master class. And then we had some of our past shows reunion come on. So every Monday and Thursday, we've been providing that, trying to stay engaged with the kids, our future artists. And um, next week, we'll go live with uh, uh, classes, summer classes for the, for the children. And I have to say, we put it online and we s the classes are full within a week. So obviously, the parents um, and the children are, are reaching out. I mean, I think we all know how important what we all do and how we all love our jobs in the arts. Um, uh, that shows. It, it's not quite as challenging for us as for Kim because... Um, we're not doing too much dance. We're doing mostly, we have a Les Mes camp, a Hamilton camp, and a Wicked camp. And um, so far, so successful. Natalia. This, well, we're at, we actually, the main challenge was to kind of take the hat of a um, CEO of a new West symphony and put a hat of a student because we had to learn how to be a media company within two weeks and jump in online and start delivering our programs online. So we made a commitment to be a steady rock uh, for our kids, specifically for Labby Harmony Project. We started our programs right away online and added a number of elective classes, including uh, music imagery, mindfulness. Uh, we were teaching them how to cope with um, the very, very um, difficult uh, situation. And we are now in uh, our sixth week um, of programming and we're planning camps, online camps as well. So I think that we put the education programs, all of us, just like Cindy and uh, Kim, uh, on the forefront. And in terms of our Musicians, we created online concerts. So we celebrated Mother's Day and Memorial Day with our patrons and musicians recorded from homes, just like Cheryl Mar Marvin and Kanehu Youth Valley Orchestra. We created this, we call them tile performances where we're side by side. And, and so the, after experiencing a bunch of technical difficulties, we finally learned how to synchronize um, all of those, and uh, we are doing our first ever online fundraiser. Uh, we were very creative because we wanted to focus specifically on the musicians of the New West Symphony and make them the heroes of uh, the New West Symphony. So we created this fundraising event called Battle of the Sections Orchestra Edition. So our uh, musicians and orchestra sections will compete against each other in front of our patrons on June 25th. And um, we have patrons who are um, contributing to their favorite team. If you team woodwinds, team string, team percussion. And so it's really, there is a little bit of a fun competition going on. And I love having our board meetings now because you just like I have a virtual screen of the orchestra behind me, our board members are super creative to put um, signs and banners, you know, trying to lobby for uh, patrons to uh, donate to their team. So I, I love that we stopped talking about COVID and started talking about uh, creating new experiences for all of our constituencies. And that's a big pivoting moment for us. Music yes, Teachers Association is very hopeful that we'll be able to have in-person recitals and festivals soon, but we've also got a backup plan just in case. So we've got Women's Composers Festival coming up and some uh, contemporary festivals, Prima Vista, Baroque and Classical Festivals. So we are planning as if we're going to meet in person, but we've got things in place that we can be doing online. We're learning how to do Facebook Live. We're learning how to have the children send in videos, just a variety of things that are happening um, virtually. Love that. Who else would like to share? Cindy Goldberg, yes, please. 
I was going to just to piggyback on that. Our teachers have been remarkably creative in the options and opportunities they've given their students through Zoom and through performance in their classrooms, in their virtual classrooms. It's been amazing to see the creativity of both the students and the teachers. It's, a, it's been actually a, a growth opportunity in many, many ways. Um, and some of our more reluctant tech teachers are being dragged in. Um, and it's been, it's been really great to see because our kids learn differently and they want, to, they want to play, they want to dance, they want to do all of those things. And um, it's been great to see the growth in that area, even though they were sad about the all district. Uh, were there any unexpected, this is sort of off script a little bit, but were there any unexpected partnerships or cross collaborations that have come up as a result of, you know, all of this? Like anyone, go ahead, Cindy Murray, then Kim. So, uh, so for me, it's given me time to uh, reach out to the other theater communities. So uh, Vista down in San Diego and 3D um, theatricals in Orange County and La Mirada. So I've formed a more uh, collaborative uh, union with them because we're all talking about, and we all use the same, the same actors. And, and I do hope that everybody um, embraces the arts going forward because these are the people that are keeping us entertained online. I mean, the artists have really, really stepped up from Keith Urban to um, Beyonce. I mean, it's the artists and the arts that's keeping our souls alive during this, so. We've had a lot of uh, outreach both ways from us and them with our alumni. And so um, it, it's really nice to reconnect with them. And some of them have agreed to do online performances to uh, promote the orchestra. And they um, share what their experience was performing with the Thousand Oaks Philharmonic as a student and what effect that had on their lives. So that's been a wonderful silver lining uh, for us. Wonderful. Kim, I think you have something. No, you're, mute. you're muted, Kim. Um, yes, we've, we've had some input from several high schools. Uh, we typically have an apprentice program, junior apprentice program for the summer. And we've had quite a few volunteers from local high schools who want to work uh, online with the company in uh, helping with our, our summer virtual camps for kids. Uh, so we've had a good partnership with, with a lot of the high school kids. So. Kim Maselli, you had something? No, oh, no, you're, you're back on mute. Okay, am I there? Yes. Okay, so I think just with this extra downtime and putting all our performances on pause, um, we've worked with um, a media and working with uh, media companies to really take the time to archive our past performances mm -hmm. and we film all of our productions but my goal has been over over years is to really create um, promos and in uh, libraries of photography and so I feel like we've had the time to really kind of invest our thought process into creating a digital platform um, which is something we probably would have thought of but not had the time to do. Um, so from the from the performing arts center one of the one of the silver linings that we've found um, is that uh, at least our our employees as part of our leadership team uh, have been challenged in the fact that we've all had to work remotely so we've all become technical gurus just like you've all uh, said but one of the other benefits uh, that we would look to as coming out of this is that we've been able to strengthen our relationships, uh, one with other venues where typically we would see each other potentially as competition if there's a similar artist or things performing in different areas. Uh, but we've been able to strengthen those relationships as well as the relationships that we have with all of our theater users, you know, trying to find uh, the creative videos that you guys have put together uh, to pivot your operations and we're trying to share those outward to all of the patrons as well because all of your patrons are our patrons and vice versa so we want to try and keep everybody as engaged as possible. Um, I wanted to actually thank you for doing that because I, I something was delivered in my 
email box today from Nikki and it had our Memorial Day concert uh, embedded in it. And I was, uh, I was really happy to see that. So thank you guys uh, for doing that. Our main uh, partnership has been with our volunteers. I think they stepped up so much um, I, in March when everything happened and we weren't sure whether we were gonna go online or we're gonna see them physically. We actually made over 400 phone calls to our subscribers just to check on them. And it was all done by volunteers. And we connected some of our seniors with Meals on Wheels if they needed help. And I was really impressed with um, the volunteer leadership stepping up. And uh, now they actually organized weekly phone calls. Um, we call them, we dubbed them up close and personal between musicians, patrons, and board, we're delivering online Zoom calls um, with just to chatter. For example, last week we had our one of our bassoon players who cooked pasta and you know actually uh, showed us how to use a bassoon and and played a little bit for us. It was a lot of fun. Um, yesterday we had one of our violas doing the same thing. So I think um, one huge discovery is that geography doesn't exist, that you can do anything online. And that has been a huge revelation that we can do all of this and not drive. Um, we miss seeing them though in person because there is, there is no comparison. Anyone else want to share? I like that, uh, Natalia. Geography doesn't exist. It's so true. Well, I would like to, to share that. Um, can you hear me, Nikki? Yes. Um, at uh, Caneo Valley Youth Orchestras, we have had several meetings with our peer youth orchestras, um, all the way from LA County, all the way up north to San Luis Obispo and um, Everybody's in the same boat, but what we, we are looking forward to our 60th anniversary. We feel very confident in going forward. And I think our families want to go forward too. So we actually opened up our, our auditions this week. So we're hoping for the best and, and we have alternate plans. Cheryl, are they online or are they in person? We will, we will be accepting video auditions. And um, as we get closer to September, hoping that things loosen up a little bit more, particularly in Ventura County, um, we'll do one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face interviews and then probably start rehearsals with smaller groups. Fantastic, congrats. That's, what, that's the plan. It's hard to just make that decision. And I'm glad oh, no. that you guys did We want to, that. we want to. I kind of want to open it up a little bit to allow you, each of you to like take yourselves off mute and let's see if we can just sort of dialogue and I'm sure you have specific questions of each other and you know we still have a little bit of time. Um, I want to ask you what the silver lining is that's come out of all of this for you perhaps personally as well as professionally but I would love to just sort of banter a little bit. One of the nice things that I've discovered teaching online is how much the students are capable of. Like they can take their own pencil and circle those staccatos. And uh, you know, they've got a lot of things that they can do that I've just kind of been doing for them. It's like, you know, I, I need to give them a little bit more space and a little bit more responsibilities. So true. Yeah, the kids will definitely uh, surprise us with their ta you know, talent, creativity, uh, and opportunity, just if they're given the opportunity to, to do that. You know, for, for our, our students, I've noticed that a lot of um, summer camps that happen all over the country at Eastman School of Music and like the Kendall Betts Horn Camp in New Hampshire, they're all online. And so kids can go to these camps um, without traveling anywhere. And many of them are taking advantage, are going to take advantage of that opportunity and are really looking forward to it. Um, we have a comment from uh, Richard Warren saying that what you're doing reminds us, reminds him of the old TV show where Leonard Bernstein brought classic, classical music to vast young audiences in a way that made it fun and understandable. Thank you. 
Richard, uh, Richard has been joining our master classes on Monday. I recognize his name when you put it up and um, he's a joy. Um, I think the thing that for me that has been most important is, um, as because the box office is not our box office, I don't really get to have one-on-one -on -one communication with our patrons. And because of this, I've been able to actually call them on the phone and speak to them. And even if they're asking for refunds, it still gives me a chance to, uh, to speak with them. The, the thing that I've been hearing the most is that they want us to play our previous shows like um, Matilda or uh, a side story. And I'm not allowed to do that. We are restricted by the union and the, the union will let us do it, but, but we have to compensate the actors as if the show was going on. And no income, that's impossible. And it's unfortunate mm. because I would love to stream some of our shows, but mm. we're restricted by that. It's it's unfortunate. Nikki, I know you're asking about silver lining, um, but one of the things that um, I have come to, reali to realize that our business model is never going to be the same. That psychologically, I think that people would not feel comfortable going and sitting um, in the audience next to each other for a long time. Yeah. And I don't know when is the next time that we're going to see everyone in their seats. And I think that um, knowing that uh, we needed to create a hybrid programming, which I think in the future, that's what we will have to do. And I don't know how it's going to look like but it will be partially online, partially in person. Um, we're kind of speaking now on the other side of COVID because everything is opening up and it's a little bit easier, but there was definitely a panic mo moment back in March when you think that your business model is broken right. completely because our job is to gather people in a happy environment. So, um, and entertain them. So my biggest, um, kind of a, uh, and I still am really basking in, in, in joy, um, my staff and, and our music director, uh, because usually you see him conduct the orchestra, but I saw him now, I'm, I'm seeing him now in a different light. He is now a creative director. He's now a script writer <laughs> and he's not conducting, but he's still conducting, okay. you know? So it's, it's been amazing that I know he was the first one. He said, I'm creating a jukebox series about my favorite playlist and I'm going to educate even though I am homeschooling every single day. So I'll carve out the time. So there has been both the moments of, despair, the moments of, oh my God, we depend, we depend on ticket sales and earned income so much. How are we going to do it in the future if we only have 300 people in the audience or 400 people in the audience to, yes, we can do this if, we come, if we're creative and we're embracing partnerships. Um, so I think 2020, 25th anniversary of the symphony, everything is kind of all came together in this spring and um, also I had the baby in December and when I came back from maternity leave I came back to a new world and a new business structure so it's been an interesting year. Mm -hmm. Well I have to say Natalia that we actually um, borrowed what you're doing with uh, Michael Christie's jukebox and started uh, our own series for TOR's playlist and so every week our staff at the Performing Arts Center are curating their own list of songs and then we attach it to a little bit of a Q&A um, and we're kind of giving the people an insight into the lives of our staff at the theater from our box office staff to our technical crew. Um, just because you, these are the people behind the scenes and you don't necessarily know them. Um, you know, some of you might know them more than others, but we kind of wanted to shine a light on these people who are normally, they're the ones who make sure that the facility runs, that they that make sure that your tickets, your patrons, your subscribers, all of them are taken care of. Um, and so we're kind of giving everyone a sneak peek into their lives uh, through their musical tastes. So thank you for that idea. And if it was Michael's, then please pass on our thanks to him. And thank you to the box office. They've been wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's been really exciting for us at Kingsman Shakespeare is to um, see how many past performers that we've had that are willing to come and engage 
uh, with this new virtual uh, performance model that we're looking at. We've had people that have uh, performed on our stage up to 10 years ago who said they want to come on and do things with us and whatever they can do to help. We're going to, we have a new um, 18 to adult camp model where uh, people can come and actually work one on one with professional actors to do monologue uh, work and things like that. And we never would have pulled that off in a live setting. We just can't let as uh, you said, geography doesn't exist. So we can get people from across the country who've worked with us before and actually engage one on one with people in, in a camp virtual camp setting. So it's been amazing how many people have jumped up and and are willing to donate time and to make things work for us. As Natalia mentioned, I think that the future for Music Teachers Association for private music teachers is also going to be hybrid. Um, so if I have a student that's moving to Virginia, that doesn't mean that I'm losing a student. It just means we'll be doing online. I also see um, as children, sometimes they've got the sniffles, they feel okay, but you really don't want them in your studio if they're sneezing and coughing. We could just do lessons at home. So I, I think that, or if somebody's on vacation, you just take your keyboard with you. So I think that there's going to be a, a more of a hybrid future for us. Yeah, we have the same uh, at the studios. We invested, even though we don't have money to spend, um, in three flat screen TVs in our three biggest studios. So that once we go back to in-studio classes, we can still provide that at home experience and Zoom opportunity for someone either who isn't comfortable coming into the studio yet or is not even in the area. Um, and we never, I mean, that wouldn't have even crossed our minds six months ago. Right. Well, we have to think how to collaborate. I know we, we did, um, our last performance was with uh, Tim's group in March. So we miss that physical collaboration, you know, that we've had with um, some of you and, and, but, you know, maybe we can come up with something online too. Yeah. Uh, John, the, John. the situation itself has given credence to everybody to push your boundaries a little bit more. And that's true for all of us. And I, I think that's one thing that we've all learned how to do is just uh, accept the uncomfortableness of learning new things as we go along and you know certainly like I said we we're challenged in the fact that we are not a producing entity so we're reliant on on everybody coming through the doors but it's been for us it's been really great to see all of the great work that you guys are doing out in the community and then trying to spotlight that out to the same patrons that you would have at the theater but at home. One of the hardest things for us is right now, during this time, our, our Starlight kids are going out to all the senior senders and singing to them. And, and we can't get in there and we can't do anything. So we provided a video for them uh, of last year's programs and we're sending it to all the seniors because they're so lonely. They, they don't have any visitors. So, so I would encourage everybody, if you could do anything for the senior centers, that would be awesome because they have portals that they can stream stuff into their actual rooms. That's a great idea. Thank you for sharing that. Let's talk a little bit about fundraising because quite frankly, we all uh, need dollars and donors. Um, I think almost all of us except the Performing Arts Center are nonprofit organizations. So how's that been going? I know Natalia shared with us uh, about the battle of the sections and that's really creative. So kudos to you guys for jumping on that so quickly. Uh, Natalia, but I'm curious to hear from the, you know, from, well, from all of you, or anyone who wants to answer, how, how is that going? How, how are your donors receiving this? Like, are, are people feeling that the arts are less important? You know, we always say that the, during crisis, the arts funding is the first thing to dry up. So how is that looking for you all? We haven't, we haven't done much. I mean, we're just trying to, yeah, I mean, and we're a, it's all volunteer except for our, our, our accompanists and our, our director, you know, they get paid, but it's my volunteers are even hard on the board. You know, they're dealing with their own fears and their own, you know, <laughs> stresses. So it, it, I think we're just starting to gear back up, but now that things are opening up more, but yeah, I think um, that's going to be a challenge. We're going to have to really kind of dive into that. How do we, get the word out that we're still here. I'm just trying to, I just want to make sure we survive this, you know, 
keep people safe and survive as an organization. So it, yeah, I think. While being sensitive to everybody else, there's so many people out of work. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it's, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for our ballet company, I feel like at this point, we only do one big fundraiser a year and it's in November. And so I didn't feel like for our situation, it was time to start asking for um, money prematurely because everybody's kind of in crisis mode and people have lost jobs. And um, there's just so much unknown that for us, we felt like we just needed to settle and kind of ride this out and slowly start to reopen and see where we are. And in our um, ballet company supporters know that for us, it's kind of November that we, we have our gala. And so I'm sure that will look very different this year. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to ask someone for money when you know everybody's struggling. It is. But I, but I am getting donations. People are being very generous and just sending in, uh, you know, checks sporadically just to keep the arts alive here. I mean, it's, Caneo Valley is a pretty remarkable community. Yeah. I, um, I would have to echo the same sentiment. Uh, I think the key is keeping in contact with your key members. We picked up the phone, our board called every one of our families um, and our donors and just, and this was early on, just to see how they were doing. And as a result, we did get a few checks in the mail and they know we want to resume. And I think they still want to support us, but um, it's a matter of just staying in contact with them until everything, till we can resume whatever the normal is. Uh, on that note, before you continue, uh, we have a question from uh, our audience. Uh, can, can the panelists please expand on what in-person performances would look like once things open up? Will there be more solo performances or chamber music rather than full orchestra? I mean, I, with the choir, the members, our membership not wanting to get together or they're in that at risk category or they live with some of that risk, you know, one of the things I asked is, would you be interested in getting together if there was a smaller group just to put on something? And we had a few people, you know, where we could, you know, so I'm looking into that. How do we, you know, it's, it's like we put out something in December. We usually do a concert in December and a concert in May. How do we maybe do something scaled down in December? I don't know if that's going to happen, but, you know, that's something that I know I miss singing in a choral setting. I miss singing together with people, even, and I'm not in that at-risk category, to be honest. So it, it's not as much of a risk for me to get together with people. So, and how to do that in a safe way. And there's actually been some great, like through Facebook, we got a great resource for choral directors. It's just like, it was amazing on just how to plan for your next season. So we kind of are looking at that. Anyone else want to chime in? they asked about, since they asked about the orchestra, um, I think that there are two components to this. One is um, a huge component of the uh, safety of the performers. And being a union orchestra, we are working collaboratively with the union to make sure that we fulfill all of the health and safety um, uh, regulations and requirements. We want to do that. And the other part of it would be the audience. And even when the audiences are able to come in, psychologically, can they sit next to each other, et cetera. So I think that we're looking at all options, all of the above, solo performances, chamber performances with the full orchestra. Um, and I think that my board allowed me to imagine and allowed us to be creative. Um, and I'm very grateful that we can do that. Just like Kim and Jonathan, we stopped running scenarios because you would run a scenario and then, then you work the whole week and then the following week something happens and you think I should have taken a week off, you know? So now we are really uh, only working about 60 days in advance, trying to figure out what's the environment, what is the CDC saying? So all of the above, everything is on the table. And as I said, it's going to be a hybrid. We will also, I don't think that the online engagements will go away in the foreseeable future. 
I think we're all going to have to have some kind of a digital presence going forward. And, um, you know, TOR also is looking at what that might look like. And for us, actually, it's an opportunity because, as you all know, TOR presents headlining shows, which becomes our, our big earned income and our bread and butter for the theater so that we can maintain an affordable uh, facility for the community groups to perform. And so that therefore automatically excludes people from being able to, you know, certain artists, we have some great performers, talented performers in our community, but maybe they can't sell out in a theater, but maybe we can create a digital presence and have a digital subscriber base that is, you know, the, the demographic will be different. This is somewhat of an opportunity for all of us to look into audience development, a different demographic of audience development, perform, you know, both sides of the, the age spectrum. Our, um, you know, vulnerable population is going to be more or less likely to want to step out anytime soon. And our young may or may not be interested, but perhaps as a way to attract and retain them digitally. So I, I will say, because the question uh, was not, well, although it did specifically say orchestras, it did kind of ask what the performance world will look like um, it, once we get a chance to reopen. So one of the things that, uh, that our staff tackled pretty quickly on was drafting a reopening plan. So rest assured when we do get the green light and we do get the ability to reopen, uh, we ha already have a six page document in place of every protocol that we might undertake depending on what the guidance is. So if they say you can have 25% of your capacity, we have a way to try and figure out how to seat those people in the Cavley theater, maybe not in the Shear theater. Uh, we have protocols in place for masks and for sanitizer stations and for uh, sanitizing and disinfecting uh, after each show. So obviously there's gonna be a lead time to be able to get those things in place. But when we get that, when we get that opportunity to start doing what it is we love to do, uh, we are ready uh, to go ahead and, and start getting that done. Uh, and I agree. I think I, I think that, as you guys had stated, the uh, the online aspect of performances will still be there. Uh, but for so many of us, and uh, personally for me, uh, there's a reason why I wanted to pursue a career in live theater, and it's because there's a tangible quality about being in that audience, or being backstage, or even for being on stage, that you can't replace with a streaming or a digital or a video recording. We can try as best as we can, and I think that's a great pivot that we're trying to do, but we need to get back to a position where we can have that tangible quality that feeds all of our souls for what it is that we do. Amen. Yeah, I agree 100%. 100%. I mean, whether you're the artist on stage or the audience member, what roles between live performance, um, between the performer and the patron is just, it's, it's essential. You can't change that. You can't turn it into something different. Uh, we have another question from Richard Warren. How much cost do you anticipate all of these safety precautions will add and therefore affect the quality and or size of shows that you put on? that is more smaller cast productions or any such variation? So I, I can't speak to the size of cast or productions, but I, I will say that as we're evaluating what all of those precautions will be and preparing for what that guidance is, at that point we will start uh, figuring out what the true costs are. Um, you know, it, it really depends on, on what restrictions we have in place what protective equipment we have to have uh, and, uh, and how, we, how we make people feel comfortable coming back to the theater to, to see live performance. So I, I think as we get that guidance and as we get those restrictions, uh, that will give us a chance to be able to figure out what the costs would be. Um, but on the flip side, what is the cost of not being able to get in front of our, our groups? So, um, you know, we, we have to balance that as well. One of, the, one of the things we all have to look at, too, is can, can we actually put a show on with 25% with of the audience? Can, can we financially do that? And, and that's, a, that's an enormous challenge for us. For us, we put on uh, nine performances uh, three times a year, and we have to have a certain number in order to 
continue on. So that that's a challenge. And like Jonathan just said, uh, our union puts restrictions on what we're going to have to do backstage, uh, separate from what uh, the Performing Arts Center does. So it's a, it's a financial uh, challenge as well, but uh, we're working together with the theater, we're working together with the unions, and we're all doing the best we can can do. We all miss it. Oh, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour, and I want to respect everyone's time. This has been really wonderful. I'm going to invite you all to perhaps check out if there are any comments on the Facebook feed. Uh, we've been streaming live over there. We had some technical issues, but I think we caught most of this up, uh, up there. So for those of you who have questions of our, our participants, please post them to the Facebook feed uh, in the comments. And then, and the other thing I'd like to invite you all to do is post your website links in, in the comments of the Facebook feed so that people, you know, have the opportunity to, uh, to kind of learn more about you. And for all of you, the invitation is open. Please do send us, um, you know, one of the things that we're doing is this series called Lives Worth Watching. And so lives being a play on, you know, both. So if you do have these live video productions, uh, like Natalia talked about, we shared, we're doing this on a weekly basis. We're sending it out to our audiences. So send us links uh, that are already existing on YouTube. Uh, that's what, that would be ideal. Either if they're already on YouTube or Vimeo, I think we can put them into our regular um, new e newsletter and are happy to promote you guys that way. Same goes for Facebook. Um, feel free to tag Thousand Oaks Arts at Thousand Oaks Arts on Facebook um, and on Instagram. You know, when you're, and we'll, we'll, we will re-promote as best we can for all of you because you are all helping us keep the arts alive and thriving in the Cuneo Valley and beyond. So uh, really, really appreciate all of you being here live with us. And if you have any final comments, otherwise, uh, actually I do wanna know on a personal note, any silver linings, like we'll just end quickly, like really, one quick sentence, if you have like personal silver linings that have come out of all of this. I think I said mine. My personal silver lining is being able to connect with, with the community uh, live. I think my personal silver lining is engaging and connecting with alumni and uh, just encouraging uh, the dancers that love to dance and the families that want to continue to see ballet. It's personal. Anyone else? I love seeing the inside of my um, students' homes and seeing their piano, meeting their cat. <laughs> yeah, I think for us reconnecting with um, uh, past performers who we haven't seen maybe for five or 10 years. I think for, for us at CBYO, uh, not only connecting with our peer uh, youth orchestras, but with all of you on this live feed. Uh, Nikki can't thank you enough. It's, it gives us hope and um, reassurance that we'll all be back together again sometime soon. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you all again for both. Cindy, you have something to say, go ahead. I was just gonna say the opportunity for collaboration between groups and to build bridges where we might not have built them um, across the community and no geography um, can stop those. Uh, in addition to the boom of creativity that's been going on. So those things to me um, have been a true silver lining. <laughs>